hands. Left turn. Just hands. In open order. Inward dress. Come back up. Standard ace. Stand easy.
du Pfanne. Schön. Shoulder, arms. Got a fun action. Please be seated. Guards, the second meeting of the 2023-24 session of Parliament Royal is now present. Arms. I have apologies for absence from the Honourable Member from Georgetown South of Ireland and I've just arms. received unfortunate news from oh. the former Premier and Honourable Wayne Panton that unfortunately he had an accident yesterday and has broken several ribs and certainly will not be here today and may well miss 
the entire meeting. We all should pray and hope for his speedy recovery. Prayers. I invite Pastor Young to grace us with prayers. Please stand. Let us. Thank you. Let us pray. Our sovereign God and Father. To you this morning, we acknowledge your sovereignty. The only one who is and is to come. We present to you this morning this honorable house and the people of the Cayman Islands in whom we are grateful to you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies towards us shortly here. And as we are approach this day we thank you that you are right here with us this morning and as we place Lord this morning before you our governor our speaker of the house and our honorable premier and all elected members who have submitted themselves to this country to bring out their responsibility and their duty. I pray in the name of Jesus that whatever they do, they will do it professionally to the honor and to the glory of your name. We pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in every decision making. We pray God even right now for the honorable Wayne Panton who have, have an accident that God, you will be merciful to him. We thank you for his time that he has served in this honorable house. Bless this, your people again. Let everything to be done to the honor and glory of your name. And at the end, your name will be glorified. We give you thanks and we give you praise now in Jesus' name. Please be, please be seated. Thank you, Pastor Young. Reading by the Honorable Speaker of Messages and Announcements. I want to welcome two former senior members of this house to these proceedings. The Honorable Truman Borden, who was lead of government business for quite some time, and the Honorable Linford Pearson, who served in a number of roles, including deputy leader, deputy leader of government business, as well as speaker. Thank you all for your attendance. I will now call an Honorable Premier to move a motion for suspension of the House to allow Her Excellency the Governor to present the throne speech. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this Honorable House do suspend to await the arrival of Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jean Owen, to receive a gracious message from the throne. The motion is, or the resolution is, that this House do suspend to await the arrival of Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, to receive a gracious, gracious message from the throne. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The House is now suspended to await the arrival of Her Excellency the Governor.
Please be seated. Mr. Speaker, that's better. <laughs> Honorable members of Parliament of the Cayman Islands, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of His Majesty, King Charles III, it is a great honor for me to stand before you today to deliver my first throne speech as your governor. I'm humbled to have this opportunity to serve the people of the Cayman Islands, and I will continue to work to the best of my ability to promote the interests of all who call this beautiful place their home. Since arriving here in April, I've had the opportunity to consult and work with many honorable representatives seated here in our parliament today. I would like to thank you for your support and advice and to commend you all on your commitment and your service to our community. Our democracy continues to thrive and deliver and we can all be proud of that. I would like to extend my congratulations again to the Honourable Sir Alden McLaughlin upon his election as Speaker of this distinguished House. I offer my thanks to the Honourable Wayne Panton, our former Premier, for his counsel and friendship in the last government. And I want to express my admiration and gratitude to the Honourable Premier, Juliana O'Connor Connolly, for her leadership of the United People's Movement Government. As I look around the chamber, I see many familiar faces on our government bench. And I would like to congratulate the UPM on forming a new government with renewed focus and a new budget to present at this session. I would also like to pay tribute to the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, Roy McTaggart, and his colleagues on that side of the House for the work you do to scrutinise and contribute to the policies and decisions you will agree in the coming days. The strong principles that we can be so proud of here in our parliament are part of the shared values that root us in our deep historic relationship with the United Kingdom. This partnership continues to grow and to demonstrate clear benefits in an increasingly uncertain world. The Joint Ministerial Council in London in November, hosted by Foreign Office Minister David Rutley, culminated in a declaration signed by the Overseas Territories, reinforcing our commitment to a modern and transparent partnership and our collective ambition to deliver a prosperous and secure future for all of our people. Over the coming months, the UK proposes to agree a new bilateral compact with each separate overseas territory that would like to do so, setting out the responsibilities and obligations we share and highlighting our priorities for the future. The Honourable Premier has already expressed 
her wish for early discussions on our compact. And I look forward to working with the government and parliament as we consult widely during the process to ensure that our bilateral agreement sets the right direction for a strong future relationship. I'm proud that Cayman has chosen to be part of the British global family. And with that, to join the United Kingdom's commitment to act as a force for good in the world. This means respect for human rights, the rule of law, and defending the multilateral rules-based system embodied in the United Nations and other international treaties. As one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, as the world's sixth largest economy, a leading voice in the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and G7, and as a founding member of NATO, the UK will continue to uphold the freedoms and values that our forefathers fought so hard to defend. In recent weeks, we have all seen the tragedy unfolding in the Middle East. Israel has suffered the worst attack, terror attack, in its history, and Palestinian civilians are experiencing a devastating humanitarian crisis. The UK is working intensively to get much needed aid into Gaza to prevent regional escalation and to re-establish progress towards a two-state solution, which is the only way to ensure lasting peace and security for both Israelis and Palestinians. The United Kingdom will also continue to stand united with our international partners against Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine's sovereignty, a violation of international law and the UN Charter. That is why we have worked with allies to introduce the most comprehensive sanctions package ever imposed on a major economy. These measures are having a growing impact on Russia, and I want to highlight today the key role that Cayman plays in sanctions implementation as a global center for funds and investment. Through Operation Hector, which joins up information and enforcement across government and the private sector, we have been able to freeze around $9 billion in Russian assets. And as the world continues to close Russian attempts to circumvent the sanctions regime, we will continue to play our part to ensure that Cayman holds fast in support of peace, stability, and the rule of law. Cayman's core role within the international financial system has also been in the spotlight as the Financial Action Task Force removed our jurisdiction from its grey list and lifted the need for enhanced monitoring. It's hard to overstate how significant this move is for us. It means that FATF recognizes that Cayman has the commitment and the processes in place to enforce and combat money laundering and illicit finance. It judges that our efforts are both robust and sustainable. And it praises the close work between government, regulators, and the private sector in ensuring that our financial center meets or exceeds international standards. The task does not stop here. We will continue to work with the United Kingdom 
the European Union and other international partners to evolve workable new measures for oversight and transparency, including through our new Beneficial Ownership Transparency Act and associated regulations which will come into force in 2024. And I want to formally express my thanks to the Honourable Deputy Premier, Andre Ebanks, and his partner in fighting crime, our Honourable Attorney General, Sam Bulgin, for the role they both played in steering us through to a successful conclusion of the FATF review. As we consider Cayman's position within the international context, our minds turn inevitably also towards the question of security, crime, risks and threats, and how we can best manage and repel them. This is an issue close to my heart and to my entree as I carry out my constitutional responsibilities for security in our islands. I was grateful earlier in my tenure to have the privilege of working with former police commissioner Derek Byrne, who has passed on his leadership to our excellent new commissioner, Kurt Walton. I commend Commissioner Walton on his open, collaborative and strategic approach and I reaffirm the priorities we have agreed. We will continue to make Cayman a hostile environment for criminal activity, achieving this through feet on the ground in community policing, as well as a targeted response to specific incidents, especially those involving violence and firearms. We will continue to build our capability in investigations and forensics, as well as CCTV coverage and intelligence gathering. We share a strong belief that effective policing can only be achieved if it includes strategies for prevention, rehabilitation, and safeguarding of vulnerable individuals and groups. That is why we will continue to steer the National Security Council to develop cross-cutting strategies, for example, to combat the flow of drugs, reaching out across government and working with education, health, family services and work teams to preempt criminal activity and to provide a choice for people who may be standing at a crossroad in their lives. We're also committed to a renewed focus on road safety and the strict enforcement of penalties for those who put others in danger. As we enter the party season, I would remind everyone that we can save lives and avoid a traumatic Christmas for many families if we all select a designated driver and never get behind the steering wheel under the influence of drink or drugs or with a mobile phone in our hand. As we open our parliamentary session today, I know that we're all focused on the budget proposals which will be the subject of discussion next week. It is perhaps a good moment to pause and ponder that these proposals will be hotly debated, I'm sure, precisely because they are the vehicle through which the government delivers for our people and allocates funding to priority projects and policies. I want to recognize here today that the steep cost of living increase provides a stern backdrop for your deliberations and a call to action as we make plans 
for the coming two-year financial cycle. Cayman has a high reputation among the UK's overseas territories for prudent budget management. And I commend the Honourable Premier for her work to remain within the boundaries of the framework for fiscal responsibility agreed between Cayman and the UK. And for her efforts to achieve a balance of revenue raising and efficiencies while enabling growth in priority areas. In a few moments, we will hear from government ministers as they set out these priorities for the coming period. I do not plan to repeat them here. I would simply offer you my thoughts on what I regard as some of the most important areas. Firstly, education. This is the bedrock of growth and the hope of our young people. We must continue to strengthen our schools, create new opportunities in tech, in apprenticeships and vocational choices, as well as providing affordable routes to university, including, and perhaps especially, in the United Kingdom. Secondly, health. As our population continues to grow and age, like me, we are all exploring better ways to deliver health care and also to promote more healthy lifestyles. Next is infrastructure. There's quite a long list of projects on our horizon in transport, housing, tourism assets, and waste management. In all of this, we need to find the right balance between protecting our environment and keeping safe from hurricanes and flooding while responding to the needs of our citizens and our businesses. And this brings me on to the environment. And we speak of it during a historic week when the 28th UN Climate Conference is taking place in the United Arab Emirates. His Majesty King Charles gave the opening speech in which he noted that the world is dreadfully far off track in its efforts to retain the goal of keeping global warming within the 1.5 degree limit. He called on everyone, public and private sector, to pool their efforts to get data, to use technology, and to work constructively together in order to, as he put it, keep hope alive. I believe we can do the same here in the Cayman Islands, building on our strong track record of marine parks and our determination to create a happy, healthy, and beautiful environment which can support both lives and livelihoods for future generations to enjoy. And as we reach the end of the hurricane season, I also want to mention the importance of our resilience in the widest sense of the word, recalling the renewed focus we intend to have at the National Security Council on risk management. This means continuing to prepare for weather events, reviewing the security of our massive marine boundaries and ports of entry, planting out greater food security, and being ready for unexpected events, remembering how well our COVID strategy served us. I want to pay tribute in particular to the way in which our crisis first responders work together to prepare 
and protect us. Thank you to hazard management, to our emergency services, our regiment, the Red Cross, and the many, many other partners who support them. Many of the above areas I've just mentioned sit firmly within the responsibilities of this house rather than governor's office. But I am pleased to have developed a great working relationship with all ministers and indeed ministries that, so that we can communicate and share ideas. The United Kingdom remains committed to supporting Cayman in all of its domestic endeavors, whether this be in transport planning, policing advice, crisis training, public health, biodiversity conservation, or seabed mapping. And it is never a one-way street. Our partnership is built on mutual benefit and respect and offers an often surprising source of inspiration and opportunities for us both to learn and improve. I'm grateful for the hard work of everyone in Governor's Office and Government House who support me in managing our busy agenda, making new links and creating some fun ways to open our wonderful home on Seven Mile Beach to as many different people as we possibly can. As we progress our important national agenda, effective governance is key to delivery. We rely on our independent commissions, the judiciary, the director of public prosecutions, the auditor general, and the ombudsman to ensure that we are performing our duties to the highest standards of integrity and due process. And through the leadership of our honorable uh, Deputy Governor, Franz Manderson, I applaud our civil service for their tireless work. DG has recently introduced a refreshed strategy to further improve delivery, accountability, customer service, and teamwork across the whole of government. I know he joins me in thanking all of our chief officers who form the interface between political decisions and policy delivery and who work to ensure every day and often very late into every evening that what we agree here in Parliament or in Cabinet remains on track, on time and on target. And as I speak to you all today, I look back over the first seven months of my time here as governor. I came to listen and to learn, to work hard and to be of service. I am immensely grateful for the welcome I have received, the advice, the kindness and all of your stories. I've enjoyed visiting Cayman Brack and Little Cayman, as well as having many opportunities to visit constituencies and communities here in Grand Cayman. I haven't met everyone yet, but I have loved talking to our seniors, our young people, the people who lead our charities and businesses, our cultural icons, and our sports people. When I go walking on the beach every morning, it is so heartening to hear many, many people coming up and saying hello, because that makes sure I always start my day in a very good mood. And now I'm looking forward to a Christmas filled 
with friendship and fellowship. And in order to ensure that we complete our parliamentary session in good time for that, I will conclude here, Mr. Speaker, in wishing everyone a very happy Christmas and in committing myself again to working in support of this house and the service of all our people. God bless the Cayman Islands. Parliament is resumed. Please be seated. A vote of thanks to Her Excellency the Governor. I now call on the Father of the House to propose a vote of thanks to Her Excellency the Governor for her gracious address. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that this Honorable Parliament does record its grateful thanks to Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, for the gracious address delivered at this sitting. The question is that 
This honorable parliament does record its grateful thanks to Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, for the address delivered at this sitting. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Motion to defer debate on the throne speech. I now call on the Honorable Premier to move the motion to defer debate on the throne speech until Monday, 11th of December, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that be it therefore resolved that the debate on the address delivered by Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, be deferred until Monday, the 11th day of December, 2023. Thank you, Madam Premier. The question is, be it resolved that the debate on the address delivered by Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, be deferred until Monday, the 11th of December, 2023. Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. <clears throat> Presentation of papers and of reports. Plan and estimates for the 2024 and 2025 financial years. Budget statements for the 2024 and 2025 financial years. Purchase agreements for the 2024 and 2025 financial years. Ownership agreements for the 2024 and 2025 financial years. To be laid on the table by the Honorable Premier, Minister of Finance. The Honorable Premier, Minister of Finance and Economic Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay on the table of this Honorable House the following documents with respect to the government's 2024-2025 financial years, planning estimates for the government of the Cayman Islands, budget statements for ministries, portfolios, and offices, purchase agreements for our statutory authorities, government companies and non-governmental output suppliers, ownership agreements for statutory authorities and government companies. So ordered. Does the Honorable Premier wish to speak there too? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, when you invite me to speak on the second reading of the appropriation bill, which appears further down in the order paper today, I will so exercise my right to expound on the appropriation bill. Very well, Madam Premier. Clerk. Statements by Honorable Minister and members of the Cabinet. I now call on the Honorable Premier to deliver the government's policy statement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as you would be fully cognizant, the theme for this year's budget policy statement um, adopted, endorsed by my colleagues and the um, United People's Movement is nurturing our future, a united sustainable path to recovery, hope, and prosperity. Mr. Speaker, as I rise to present the plans of the government, first and foremost, I give thanks to Almighty God for his grace, his loving kindness, both individually as a parliament and as a nation, that we can all gather to deliberate on the people's business and recommit ourselves as instruments of his will. Mr. Speaker, indeed, it is a great privilege to be elected as a representative of the people and to be further given this tremendous responsibility of leading this government. It is my fervent prayer that God will grant me the requisite wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to so do. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Her Excellency the Governor, Mrs. Jane Owen, for her thoughtful delivery of the throne speech this morning and her commitment to a modern and transparent partnership and collaborative efforts
to deliver a prosperous and secure future for all of her people. Mr. Speaker, I also want to recognize Her Excellency diligent efforts to take the time to get to know our people by reaching out and making herself available to all the people and communities of these beautiful Cayman Islands. It has been my observation that as governor, she brings incredible wisdom, proportionality, and balance in her approach that truly represents our monarch, His Majesty, King Charles III, while respecting the Caymanian way of life. Mr. Speaker, I'm also very grateful to my cabinet colleagues who came together with the united purpose of finalizing this said budget. We have had a great deal, a number of challenges over the past few months. We've weathered many a storm. We've made tough decisions. But the love of our country and the interests of our people keeps us united. And we will continue to use this as our guiding light and principle. The United People's Movement, the UPM, has hit the ground running. I wish, therefore, to take this opportunity to publicly congratulate my three parliamentary secretaries, the Honorable McKeever Bush, Mr. Bernard Bush, and Ms. Heather Bodden, who received their instruments of appointment from Governor Owen on Wednesday, the sixth day of December. Mr. Speaker, they bring a wealth of knowledge and experience and will be supporting several cabinet ministers to deliver on government's priorities over the next 14 months. I also want to thank my friends on the other side of the aisle, Mr. Speaker, and I call them my friends because indeed they are, for their conscientious engagement with all of the issues which we all seek to address for the betterment of all of our constituents. Yes, we do have the naysayers, Mr. Speaker, those who question our motives in this honorable house, but as former United States Theodore Roosevelt said in his famous Citizens in the Republic speech in 1910, and I quote, it is not the critics who count, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man or woman who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never knew victory nor defeat." Unquote. Mr. Speaker, with the help of Almighty God, the United People's Movement is willing to take on the challenges that confront us because we believe we can make a difference in the lives of our people and we therefore urge our residents to continue to pray daily for those of us in authority. Mr. Speaker, I also want to express my gratitude for your acceptance of this most important task in presiding over this esteemed House of Parliament. Your duties are indeed very challenging. However, you do bring to the table a tremendous wealth of knowledge and a deep passion for the history of our beloved country and our parliament, which no doubt serve this honorable house and all members extremely well. We are indeed confident that our renewed sense of purpose, unity, and commitment will assist in charting the way forward as we look to create a sustainable path to recovery, hope, and prosperity. 
our vision, from our commitments. Therefore, we see a springing up of our vision, the vision of a unified government and country by extension, focused on continuing our island's ongoing economic recovery in a measured and sustainable manner that provides hope and prosperity to all Caymanians. Mission. When our government was recently formed, we chose the roles and assignments of each member to emphasize the group's shared ideals. As we continue to work together in the pursuit of the government's five broad outcomes for the people of the Cayman Islands, which are as follows. Improve the quality of life for our Caymanians. Enhance our competitiveness while meeting our international standards. Modernize the government to improve public sector performance. Future proof to increase resilience and protect and promote Caymanian culture, heritage, and identity. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, you see our overarching goals have not changed. This government remains determined to empower Caymanians to live productive and prosperous lives and ensure that future generations have much better opportunities. Building on our achievements. Mr. Speaker, as members of this Honorable House will see, in the 2024-2025 budget, the key priorities over the next 14 months will build on the successes of the past several years and show continued and renewed commitment to a people-centered policies and projects. The well-being and success of our people is at the core of the 2024-2026 strategic policy statement and therefore remains our guiding principle. The government continues to focus on preparing our people to deal with the realities of an ever-changing world and equip them to face the future and hope with utmost confidence. Mr. Speaker, over the past two and a half years, we have seen our economy on its way to full recovery, primarily due to the robust increases in most sectors led by construction, real estate, and the financial services. The prudent actions that were taken after the pandemic have borne economic fruit. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honorable Wayne Panton, member from Newlands, namely for his dedication, his service during his tenure as Premier. It is through his leadership of the country in the second half of the pandemic that we were able to successfully reopen the country's borders without having to re-implement any lockdown measures. This is another remarkable story against all odds. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, the economic expansion we are undergoing is expected to continue with the projected growth of 3.1% in 2023 and 2.2% in 2024. However, along with economic growth, we have also had to deal with inflationary press pressures which are not, Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt generated within our local economy, but is driven by significant global events and occurrences way beyond our shores. The Consumer Price Index inflation rate accelerated to an average of 9.5% for 2022. The average inflation for 2023 is projected at 5.2%, and for 2024, inflation is projected at 2.5%. These inflationary pressures have become a heavy burden on the shoulders of all of our people, increasing the cost of living for them and their families. We have seen the unsustainable situation and have taken action to relieve this burden. Mr. Speaker, some of the substantive actions that we have taken to ease the burden of the cost of living include 
but are not limited to. Free meals to all our private, primary and secondary public schools, reintroduction of the private school grant, increase A-level scholarship funding to cover the two years, increase funding for scholarships at both the undergraduate and the graduate school levels, plus an additional stipend to cover expenses such as travel to Jamaica or other ways for a visa, that is student visas. We have also increased the seamen and veteran benefits, increased senior citizens and people living with disabilities. They will also receive, as was announced by my deputy this week, an additional $250 for the upcoming Christmas season. Public service pensioners who have served for 10 years or more will also receive an ex gratia uplift starting this month. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we have sought to cushion the blow for, from the inflation through the following measures. Reducing fees for seniors on motor vehicle license and passport applications, providing financial and technical support to cover 400 micro and small businesses through the Cayman Islands Center for Business Development. <clears throat> we have waived import duties on feminine products and baby items. We have increased the duty allowance from 500 Cayman Islands dollars to 1,000 Cayman Island dollars for returning residents to the Cayman Islands commencing the 1st of December and ending the 5th of January, 2024, bearing in mind should we work late for those civil servants who may miss the Christmas holiday away can take it up for the old year's night into the new year, hence the reason for ending 5th of January. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, it is important in the area of housing that we have also committed to help Caymanians secure a home that they can afford, and we have followed through on our commitment in several ways. Earlier this year, amendments to the stamp duty concessions for prospective Caymanian homeowners made it far more affordable for Caymanians to buy both first and second properties. The amendments will help these Caymanian homeowners in the following way. By increasing the value of existing prices eligible for a full waiver of stamp duty for first-time Caymanian buyers and introducing a new formal tier of stamp duty concessions for Caymanians, again, purchasing their second property. In real terms, Mr. Speaker, the revised concessions will provide significant financial relief for a Caymanians purchasing home or land. For example, a young couple purchasing their first home for $600,000 would normally have to pay $45,000 in stamp duty. The revised concession would now save them this $45,000, which they can put towards their children's education or save for their very own retirement. While we are focused on our economic recovery, our policies have remained people-centric. We reduced unemployment to the lowest rate in decades, Mr. Speaker, and encourage the growth of small businesses. In addition to ensuring that Caymanian families benefit from the country's economic development and supporting in the local economy and tourism sector, we also acted to protect and sustain our island's key economic pillar, the financial services industry. The Ministry of Financial Services and Commerce, Mr. Speaker, remains very adamant that financial services remain a strong, resilient driver in our economy, which presents significant educational and employment opportunities for our people and contributes in immeasurable ways to the expansion and robustness of our economy. It will continue to be supported and promoted by this government, the UPM administration. Mr. Speaker, you and all honorable members may recall media reports 
detailing our progress in being removed from the Financial Action Task Force of the FATF Gray List in October this year. This tremendous effort made by the government, in particular the member from West Bay South, my Deputy Premier, who is also Minister for Financial Services, worked hand in glove with our Honorable Attorney General, our regulators, our island's financial services industry, for over two and a half years to achieve this outcome. It demonstrates what can be accomplished through unity, determination, and foresight. As a highly regarded international financial services center, with financial services being the backbone of our economy, the Cayman Islands came together with single-mindedness to achieve our FATF delisting through the implementation of effective sanctions, beneficial ownership, money laundering, prosecutions, and convictions. Mr. Speaker, allow me please to take this opportunity to publicly thank the many people who contributed to this outcome. On behalf of the government and the people of these islands, we are grateful for their professionalism, expertise, and desire for nation building. I also wish to acknowledge once again the most capable leadership of the Honorable Deputy Premier and Minister of Financial Services. And in this respect, I beg your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, to call his name Honorable Andre Ebanks because history should record such a valiant and tremendous attempt on his behalf and that of the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Samuel Bulgin, in this most critical task. A key component of our um, FATF delisting was demonstrating that our beneficial ownership reg regime met the global standard. Just last month, we strengthened our alignment with the FATF by passing the Beneficial Ownership Transparency Act 2003. Again, I wish to thank my colleagues on both sides of this House for their cooperation and indeed their commitment to ensure that this matter of paramount importance was dealt with expeditiously, sending a signal to the entire world that we are united when it comes to protecting our economy and the maintenance of global standards. Mr. Speaker, at the heart, the Act will help competent authorities, both locally and globally, prevent and detect and prosecute crime whenever it occurs. These two key achievements position our financial services industry for continued success as we move into a bright future, strong and coordinated efforts of this kind is what is needed to deal with any challenges that may arise in the face of Cayman's continued success, stability, and upward trajectory. A central element to our success story with the financial services has been telling our story. The Deputy Premier and his team in the Ministry of Financial Services has engaged in face-to-face -face dialogue with some of the individuals and bodies that have been most critical of the Cayman Islands, often relying on date, outdated information, or even worse, Mr. Speaker, unfounded claims to paint an unfair picture of our industry. This high level of engagement and professionalism demonstrates that firstly, we have nothing to hide. And secondly, we are ready for the world stage. Most importantly, Mr. Speaker, they are hearing directly from competent Caymanian professionals who has worked both in the financial services industry and the public sector. So, Mr. Speaker, I wish to express my profound pride in the way that our Honorable Deputy Premier has represented us not only with FATF, but to the European Commission and the United Kingdom, as well as in the Caribbean region. This ministry's 2024-2025 budget is driven by its objective to achieve 
a positive assessment on FATF fifth round review, maintaining market and commercial leading edge in financial, maritime, and aviation services, enhancing local intellectual property registration, and streamlining the licensing framework for our local businesses. I also welcome this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, for our Parliamentary Secretary, who hails from the West Bay North constituency, to support his minister in the area of commerce, which I will allow the minister to expand during his contribution. Of course, Mr. Speaker, as mentioned earlier, the minister will continue to advocate on behalf of her financial services industry, dispelling untruths and defending our solid record of compliance with global standards, providing our allies and our partners with accurate information so that they too can defend us when in Brussels, Westminster, Whitehall, Washington DC, or any of the international media. We will continue to valiantly defend this pillar of our economy. Please permit me to introduce, Mr. Speaker, some of the key initiatives to be undertaken across ministries in the upcoming financial year. The respective ministers will, of course, elaborate and elucidate during their respective presentations. Firstly, the Ministry of Investment, Innovation, and Social Development. The Honorable Member from West Bay South and our Honorable Deputy Premier also carries the responsibility for a second and important ministry, namely Investment, Innovation, and Social Development. A few of the initiatives to be undertaken for 24-25 under this said ministry include the launch of an EID card program for residents of our Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, legislation, a cornerstone of social development efforts, remains a priority. Amendments to the Children Act 2012 are underway, which will see the establishment of the Office of a Children's Commissioner. Simultaneously, the Minister will be working on the repeal and replacement of the Adoption of Children Act and amendments to the Older Persons Act. These legislative measures will be vital in fortifying the protection and welfare of our most vulnerable in our population. The Minister will also be strengthening the work of the Department of Children and Family Services, the multi-agency safeguarding hub and the Sunrise Adult Training Center to meet the evolving needs of the clients they serve. For the subject of social development, our Honorable Premier, Deputy Premier is assisted by Parliamentary Secretary, the elected member for Savannah, who is known throughout these islands for her compassion and her care. I think we are all thankful that she gets to continue exactly where she left off. <clears throat> so Mr. Speaker, our Honorable Deputy Premier demonstrates that it is possible to focus on the welfare of our people while also remaining focused on the economy. That balance, you see, embodies the spirit of the UPM and I dare say every member of the government. At the end of 2021, due to closing of our borders as a result of the pandemic, our tourism industry, like others across the world, suffered tremendously. We were therefore eager to reopen, but we had to do so wisely. Having carefully navigated the critical recovery phase of the pandemic, our economy has emerged stronger. The Ministry of Tourism and Ports I am pleased to report, Mr. Speaker, that as of September this year, the Cayman Islands tourism showed a steady upward trajectory. Between January and September of 2023, stay over and cruise arrivals to the Cayman Islands maintain an upward momentum with the destination seeing a 105% increase in total visitation compared to the same period in 2022. Our islands welcome 
323,038 say over visitors and 930, 621 cruise visitors between January and September 2023. This represented 83.6% of the 2019's visitation numbers, far surprised, surpassing the destination's target of 70% of our 2019 visitation numbers. Standout months included January with 89% of the 2019 visitation and September, which is normally our slowest month, saw 88% increase over 2019. With Cayman having exceeded its visitation goal of 70% of the 2019 records in the first three quarters, Mr. Speaker, my colleague, the Honorable Minister for Tourism and Sports, the member from Georgetown Central, Honorable Kenneth Bryan, is very confident that we are on track for a full tourism recovery by the end of this year. Mr. Speaker, permit me again to please convey my appreciation to the Honorable Minister of Tourism and his diligent team for their continuous efforts in improving this most important pillar of our industry. Again, I want to make it known that the UPM stands behind our tourism industry. I also want to commend the Honorable Minister not only for his tireless efforts locally, but for his regional leadership as the chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization. He has advocated on behalf of the Cayman Islands and has represented us well on the global stage, showing that we Caymanians can succeed when we are afforded the opportunity. Some may question why our minister should spend time on efforts that arguably support our competitors. Well, it is because our international engagement and advocacy is like a rising tide which lifts all boats. A strong Caribbean region means more potential visitors for all of our destinations. After all, we are our brother and sister keepers. One could easily argue that the pace of our tourism recovery has been hastened by our minister's direct involvement with the CTO. Well done, minister. You continue to enjoy our unequivocal support. Mr. Speaker, while the minister will go into further details, I want to mention that some of the Ministry of Tourism and Port projects and priorities for 2024 and 2025 <clears throat> include construction of a new general aviation terminal, a runway extension at the Owen Roberts International Airport, expansion of Cayman Airway routes, and activities to attract new screen production business in the islands. <clears throat> the team will also be focused on diversification of the tourism product with a greater emphasis on eco-tourism and expansion into emerging and secondary tourism markets. Of course, it would be remiss of me to overlook the parliamentary secretary assigned to tourism, my dear friend, the member from Savannah. There is no one who has championed beautification in these islands like her. And as we open our doors to welcome the world, we will need to ensure that our highways and byways, our communities and corners are immaculately kept, hygienic and enhanced. Mr. Speaker, both the Minister and the Parliamentary Secretary show that good old Caymanian way of rejecting uncleanliness. Ministry of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, neither our people nor our economy can thrive without us having a healthy and well society. The UPM administration is fortunate to have a strong and qualified champion in the form of our minister, the Minister for Health and Wellness, my esteemed colleague, the elected member from Prospect. She is dynamic, energetic, and committed to this area. A trained nurse, she has naturally taken her ministerial responsibilities, never ever shying away from the hot button issues. Over the next two years, 
Some of the new initiatives by the Ministry of Health and Wellness will include the development of a national health care strategy, including clinical standards, facilitating the promulgation of a new public health act, environmental health act, and regulations to effectively regulate and manage all public health and environmental health functions. Focus will also be on continuously improving the current solid waste management on the landfills on Grand Cayman, Cayman Brac, and Little Cayman through investment in necessary staff, replacement of outdated equipment, and inadequate infrastructure. Home Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I will use this time to highlight Home Affairs, which is the second ministry under the member from Prospect. During the financial year, the ministry plans to professionalize public safety services through accountability and development of the employees. It will also focus on youth development programs that provide career pathways into a uniform and public safety agencies. For example, moving our young people from the cadets to the fire service or the Coast Guard is modernizing government, future-proofing, and improving the quality of life for our people all in one. The Ministry of Home Affairs has taken an intelligent, driven approach to justify its largest expenditures, such as starting the design of a prison that will meet international standards. They will also be investing in prison offenders management and rehabilitation reform. Additionally, the Ministry will be upgrading the national CCTV system to collect more specific sets of data to aid in public safety. Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency. Mr. Speaker, I am so honored to serve in a cabinet comprising of three Caymanian women. <clears throat> the third woman to join our cabinet is none other than the former Speaker, Honorable Catherine Ebanks Wilkes the elected member for West Bay Central, who will speak later on, Mr. Speaker. Even as a first-time parliamentarian, she has demonstrated to this, our country, her abilities to wrap her mind around a very complex yet important subject. I am therefore most thankful to her for not only taking the Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency, but for also seeking to take responsibility for Gender Affairs Unit, which will be moving to her ministry. We cannot have a sustainable society without properly addressing gender gaps, gender violence, and other key issues. My colleague, the Honorable Minister for West Bay Central, has demonstrated a willingness to build on the gains that we made as we seek to cultivate a lasting legacy of sustainability in the Cayman Islands by achieving environmental, social, and economic balance to make the lives of our people and future generations of Caymanians much better. With its focus on developing programs to enhance Caymanian sustainability and supporting climate change resilience, the minister and ministry will in the upcoming year work to complete the 2023-2040 Cayman Islands Climate Change Policy, support the creation of an overarching sustainability framework to guide the work of public entities and further enhance protected areas and the protection of indigenous species. The ministry intends to work collaboratively across government agencies for the development and implementation of strategies to create a more sustainable, climate-resilient future, including innovation, biodiversity, food security, green technology, and renewable energy. Mr. Speaker, I want now to take a moment to thank the leadership and staff of Sustainability, Climate Resiliency for all of the hard work they have undertaken over the past two and a half years. 
Some of the gains made in the area of environmental sustainability and resilience are as follows. Facilitated the purchase and protection of significant acreage across the Cayman Islands, including parcels in the Salina Reserve, Sand Key, Western Mangroves area, Central Mangrove wetlands in Grand Cayman, Tarpon Lake, and the east interior of Little Cayman, and Hamilton Forest and Cayman Brack. Commenced the Darwin Grant-funded Cayman Deep Sea Project with partners Marine Conservation International and Beneath the Waves to better document the deep sea resources of the Cayman Islands at depths between 50 to 200 meters or 165 to 6,500 feet. In February, they released climate change risk assessment of 2022, final evidence report for the Cayman Islands, and the most comprehensive review of climate risk undertaken ever in our islands. They launched the Cayman Home Energy Efficiency Retrofit to include some of the National Housing Development Trust affordable homes and the completion of public consultation meetings for the draft 2023 to 2040 Cayman Islands Climate Change Policy. The Ministry of Planning, Agriculture, Housing, Infrastructure, Transport and Development. Mr. Speaker, for the 2024-2025 financial year, the Ministry will develop a comprehensive national development plan, implement the 22-2037 Cayman Islands Food and National Security Policy, and undertake several key road projects through the National Roads Authority. The Ministry, through the NHDT, the National Housing Development Trust, will undertake multiple projects to develop homes throughout the districts on Grand Cayman while completing a national public and affordable housing policy and a 10-year strategic plan to implement these various initiatives that support a sustainable approach to housing. In an effort to improve the quality of service that we deliver to the public, organizational reviews will be completed on several of the key departments and agencies within that ministry. Furthermore, the National Road Safety Campaign will continue as we make a genuine and coordinated effort to reduce the number of lives lost through traffic fatalities to zero. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to applaud the drive and the passion of the Honorable Minister, the member from Northside, Minister for Planning, Agriculture, Housing, Infrastructure, Transport, and Development. He cares deeply and compassionately for the areas that he has been assigned. In particular, his vision and passion for farming food security demonstrates wisdom far beyond his years and should be a source for optimism and inspiration to all Caymanian farmers. The minister's willingness to introduce innovation to the industry and improve farmers' access to the support and services of the department have all gone a very long way to boosting morale for our local farming community. I'm also pleased, Mr. Speaker, that he has accepted the support of the Honorable Minister for West Bay to serve as his parliamentary secretary in all areas of planning, housing, infrastructure, and transport, and development, but not in the area of agriculture, and he can expound when he so elucidates later on. Ministry of Border Control, Labor, and Culture. Mr. Speaker, it is indeed my pleasure to welcome back to the cabinet, my friend and esteemed colleague, the Honorable Member from Bodentown East, and Minister and Minister for Border Control, Labor and Culture. He brings with him a wealth of experience and wisdom to our team. Mr. Speaker, you will likely recall, perhaps with a smile, albeit, the dedication and commitment of this minister, having spent every day for almost two months on television with him keeping our country informed and connected through the height of the COVID pandemic. He is also very sensitive 
and keenly aware to the needs of our people. It is most admirable, this trait that he possesses, and one which will help to keep us focused on the most important things. He's also very passionate about our Caymanian culture and is excited to add this subject. Key initiatives for his ministry for the upcoming financial year include the continuation of the upgrades to the custom online system, collaboration with enforcement agencies locally and internationally to protect our communities from the importation of firearms and drugs. In the upcoming year, Mr. Speaker, the ministry intends to bring legislative changes to Immigration Reform Act in order to address the many, many outstanding issues. We believe that sensible, might I repeat, Mr. Speaker, sensible immigration reform is needed. While we accept that foreign labor will be required to maintain our economy, we also do not accept that everyone who, upon their arrival, should be on an automatic pathway to citizenship. These are important yet sensitive discussions that we must all have as a community. I am therefore pleased, Mr. Speaker, that the minister is committed that he will be ably supported by the Honorable Member from West Bay West, who will also serve with him as a parliamentary secretary. Mr. Speaker, labor issues remain important as we must always strive to ensure that we provide pathways for Caymanians to advance in their profession of choice. We should also be fair to our low-paid workers. The final report of the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee has now been duly noted by our Cabinet. I will give the Minister the opportunity during this debate to touch on the timeline for this significant matter being taken forward by this government. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I wish to highlight that postal services will fall under this said ministry, which coincides with the Cayman Islands hosting the Caribbean Postal Union Conference in 2024. However, again, I will allow the minister to provide further details. The Ministry of Youth, Sports and Heritage. In 2024-2025, the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Heritage intends to ensure that facilities are upgraded, maintained to an international standard, increase awareness of our Caymanian heritage through development of materials, stories, videos, and displays of artifacts in more locations throughout our islands. They will also promote and support athletes and young people in our forums that ensure their development and maximization of opportunities available to them all. Mr. Speaker, we have all borne witness to Cayman exceptional regional and international performances in swimming. We all agree that it's now high time for us to invest in a state-of-the-art 15-meter Olympic-sized pool and a warm-up pool. Our first competitive pool, sponsored by the Lions Club, was constructed in 1986 and has served us well. Cabinet has just this week approved the assignment of Crown Land near to the Truman Bottom Sports Complex and incorporating the current Lions Pool to be utilized for the development of a new aquatic center for the Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, you too share a deep love and a keen interest in the preservation and promotion of the Caymanian history. Some amongst us still struggle with our sense of identity and our desires of a deeper understanding of our past, especially as we navigate new uncharted paths. That is why we are looking forward to celebrating for the very first time in two generations the reinstatement and celebration of Emancipation Day, which will replace Discovery Day as a holiday in May of next year. The decision to celebrate the holiday in May is in recognition of Cayman's unique emancipation story, one which sets it apart from the rest of the Caribbean. While emancipation came almost one year after it was implemented in other British colonies, 
Such was the outrage of the British governor that Cayman had delayed its implementation, received full emancipation on the 5th of May, 1835, and bypassed the period of apprenticeship which took place across other colonies. So, Mr. Speaker, the slaves in the Cayman Islands were the first to be truly freed. This, along with the incredible story of a strong, intrepid, and unbowed female slave named Long Celia, will be celebrated and highlighted as we tell our own story to future generations. We will be educating the public more on the slavery's impact on our islands, and as we approach the first official celebrations in May 2024. Mr. Speaker, I wish to offer my sincere appreciation to the Honorable Member and Minister from East End, our Minister of Youth and Sports Heritage, as well as the former Minister, Mr. Bernie Bush, who has embraced this topic with enthusiasm, and it continues. He is both, they are both deeply connected to our Caymanian heritage and has throughout their lives volunteered with organizations who work closely with young people to protect our heritage. I am confident in their abilities to seek this important work in the ministry through, one as minister and the other as parliamentary secretary. Mr. Speaker, in the true spirit of sports, that is team spirit. The minister has welcomed, as I said, his predecessor in the role, the Honorable Member from West Bay North, to act as his parliamentary secretary to support the efforts to complete major sporting, youth, and heritage projects which the parliamentary sector started. There is no question about the parliamentary sector heart and passion for these subjects. So I am confident that together, the minister and this PS will make a dynamic duel. The Office of the Deputy Governor. Mr. Speaker, the top priorities for the Office of the Deputy Governor 2024-2025 period are to provide strategic support to establish and operationalize two new key issues with important good governance functions. These will be the Enterprise Risk Management Unit responsible for providing coordination, leadership, and support services for effective risk management within the core government and advice to statutory authorities, government-owned companies, SA, GCS, and a secure vetting unit responsible for providing security checks, vetting clearances, and continuous monitoring for sensible roles within core government, uniform services, and SA, GCS. Mr. Speaker, the office also intends to continue to provide targeted, effective policy advice and strategic support to the deputy governor to help him achieve his goals for effective functioning of our beloved civil servants, including coordination and delivery of the deputy governor's and governor's priority projects related to training of our civil servants. Before I continue, Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the hard work, dedication, and unwavering commitment of our Honorable Deputy Governor. He is a servant leader who deeply cares for the welfare of his civil servants. Civil servants should know that the UPM administration values this service, their advice, and their ability to deliver on our commitments. While we set the policies, Mr. Speaker, you would know that the civil service carries these said policies out. And so we look forward to them delivering on the policies and priorities in this budget in a true spirit of partnership. Mr. Speaker, there's also much important work that's being done by the um, portfolio of legal affairs as they draft so many pieces of legislation that we are considering um, to move this country forward for either by revisions or reform, and they will be continued to be led by the portfolio of legal affairs. They have done tremendous work against the anti 
money laundering, counterterrorism financing, proliferation financing, and financial sanctions. And it could not be led, in my humble opinion, by anyone better than Honorable Attorney General. <clears throat> we will also continue to support the request from the judiciary to ensure that the important work of the courts are not in any way interfered with, delayed, or fettered. We are proud of our um, judiciary as they're not only renowned within the Caribbean um, jurisprudence, but internationally as well. Mr. Speaker, we also see that um, our team, ministry teams, will be focused on developing and implementing government-wide results based on management and accountable framework for assessing the financial and non-financial performance. The Ministry of Education, my passion, is to speak up. The Ministry of Education focus will be on strengthening the delivery of education at all levels, from early education through tertiary level, with developing both curricula and physical activities. Technological advancement in education, Mr. Speaker, throughout my tenure as Minister for Education, I have sought to prioritize enhancing technological infrastructure in all of our government schools. This commitment is evident in several initiatives, including providing digital services to all government school students, investing in enhanced network equipment for our schools, and crafting a national digital learning policy to guide our schools in implementing effective digital learning strategies and equipping students with essential computing skills. In August of 2022, Mr. Speaker, we took another significant step towards this goal by introducing Promethean panels to replace the current interactive whiteboards. These advanced panels will significantly enhance the quality of education imparted in our schools. Our ICT team has successfully now installed 314 Promethean display panels across our schools, the first in the Caribbean, and they provide comprehensive training to approximately 275 educators on their effective utilization. I'm also pleased to share, Mr. Speaker, that in all 15 of our school leaders have now easy access to information on the go through iPads. Additionally, all 13 secondary schools, physical education teachers can now comprehensively evaluate accurate techniques for various athletic activities and provide pupils with video-based evaluations. Supporting Caymanian learners. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education is committed to increasing the support to Caymanian students. Our scholarships and grants currently enable 634 students to pursue overseas studies and over 1,200 to pursue post-secondary, TVET, and tertiary studies locally. This demonstrates our unwavering commitment to provide equal opportunity to all of our aspiring leaders. Last December, Mr. Speaker, we introduced the prestigious Government High School Scholar Award, valued at 100,000 Cayman Island dollars to inspire and recognize excellence among our valued students while highlighting the importance of our government schools. Congratulations are in order to Abigail Rose and Diamond White, both John Gray High School students. Yes, that beautiful new high school just up the way, who were the first to receive this distinguished recognition. We look forward to announcing the next high school scholars in January 2024. Also notable among our efforts to empower Caymanian learners, Mr. Speaker, has been our introduction of the local technical vocational education and training TVET grant. This new program is designed to equip Caymanians who have already completed their compulsory education with essential skills and training they need to succeed in the dynamic field of TVET. 
The grant is valued up to 15,000 CI dollars per year. It will cover tuition fees, course materials, and required equipment for eligible courses lasting 18 months or less, offered by registered local private institutions. Prospective learners, Mr. Speaker, may apply for this grant online at www.moescholarships.gov.ky. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to ensuring that all our Caymanian students have a strong foundation in mathematics. We have developed a numerous strategy for our government schools to ensure that every single primary school student have a robust foundation in mathematics before moving on to secondary education. In addition, we have now provided extensive training to school leaders through the National Center for Excellence in Teaching Mathematics Mastery Pathway, and we have also now recruited 14 specialists in math for teaching to enhance math instruction in primary schools. In other words, Mr. Speaker, we no longer have general knowledge teachers teaching math, but math specialists and professionals in our primary school providing the very necessary mathematical foundation to our students. Mr. Speaker, as a part of our strategy to improve the quality of teaching in our schools, the ministry has also engaged approximately 80, 80 assistant teachers across government primary schools and secondary schools up to year nine. Our aim is to support our classroom teachers as they apply teaching and learning strategies to help students, particularly those with special educational needs, realize their full potential. We extend our gratitude to our recruitment team for their diligent efforts to ensure that our schools have the necessary support to provide quality education to all our students. And it is our modus operandi that no student will be left behind. Fostering inclusive education. Mr. Speaker, over the past few years, we have witnessed a growing number of students with special education needs and disabilities. In fact, at a Savannah school, one in every four students are found to have an SEN need, and we are responding to those statistics. In this view, we are working diligently to create a more inclusive education system by providing small group instructions as required so that our most vulnerable students can participate fully in mainstream education system. In 2021, we introduced a comprehensive code of practice for identifying, assessing, and providing additional learning support needs in education. Throughout the academic year, we trained and supported all principals, both public and private schools, and special education need coordinators in relation to this code of practice. Mr. Speaker, the additional learning support needs policy has also been put in place to ensure that our children and our young people have the additional learning support needs, which include special educational needs and disabilities that they're able to assess appropriate learning opportunities and provisions. I am pleased to report that now 42 students have benefited from this learning support classes at Prospect Primary, John Gray, and Clifton Hunter High Schools. Mr. Speaker, as a part of our ongoing effort to cultivate a supportive and inclusive learning environment that caters to all learners' needs, we have also repurposed a the physical education room at the Sir John A. Cumber Primary School in the District of West Bay to create an autism-specific classroom and a sensory room. This supportive and common environment create, caters to the needs of seven critical stage one students and those who require a quiet place to de-stress. These specialized facilities aim to better equip students for integration into mainstream classes, education capital projects. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you're no doubt aware that in March this year, we officially opened the doors of the spectacular, long-awaited, purpose-built 
new John Gray High School. This school was meticulously designed to foster innovative teaching and methodologies to provide ample opportunities for vocational pathways. The institution boasts of a state-of-the-art performing arts center, an automotive workshop, specialized labs for clothing and textiles, food and nutrition, design and construction technology. It stands, Mr. Speaker, as a testament to our commitment to providing every student with the resources and support they need to realize their full potential. Throughout the year, Mr. Speaker, we advanced several capital projects also aim at increasing the school's capacity to accommodate the growing population in their respective communities. Mr. Speaker, as a part of these efforts, you'd be happy to hear, seeing that it's your constituency and you have advocated for it for some time, work has now commenced on the new year six block at the Red Bay Primary School and on converting the existing year six area to reception classes. Additionally, work progressed on the construction of the Theoline McCoy Primary School Hall and a walking track that was established at the Creek and Spot Bay Primary Schools. As stated in the budget overview, we also have plans for the construction of a new Cayman Brack High School, a new high school in West Bay, a new hall at the Joanna Clark Primary School in Savannah, and the expansion of the Lighthouse School to include 11 additional teaching spaces. So you see, we're not just building the Kim and Brack High School. The Department of Educational Services Facilities team has implemented several smaller projects to enhance our school's physical infrastructure. These include the construction of a new wheelchair ramp at the Prospect Primary and the creation of a new student holding area at the Theoline McCoy Primary in Bordentown. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to providing world-class education to all our students in the Cayman Islands. By fostering inclusive learning environments, investing in the state-of-the-art facilities, the question is often asked, who are we developing for? In order to break those ceilings, we have to do it through education. And after this minister have exited the stage of politics, no one should ask in their minds, who we were developing for. We were building, yes, state-of-the-art facilities for first-class citizens, not known as ghost Caymanians, but our belongers and Caymanians in this island we call home. <clears throat> we are continuing to improve our infrastructure. We are ensuring that every child has an equal opportunity to thrive. Regarding the issue of a project-based grant Mr. Speaker, that program, I want to inform honorable members that this has enabled government schools to embark on specific non-operational projects that directly benefit our students. During 22 and 23 academic year, four schools were awarded funding support for a total of eight projects. These projects included the development of mobile science lab stations upgrading design and technology equipment, building student benches for breaks and lunch at the Clifton Hunter High School. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the Red Bear Primary School received funding for the development of a reading cafe, a nature garden, as well as outdoor enrichment and learning centers reception. East End Primary School, long thought to have been forgotten, not under this minister, they received the support for the installation of security systems, improvement of audiovisual systems, while Lehman East Scott High School in Kim and Bragg received specialized resources for children with special education needs for the first time ever. Mr. Speaker, the ministry also reinstated funding to all 19 registered independent and assisted schools to the tune of two million Cayman Island dollars. The schools used the fund to enhance school facilities, improve student health, safety, provide scholarships to Caymanian students, support staff, development, and improve special education needs capabilities. With this said, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education maintains its vigilance 
over private institutions. In 2022, three independent institutions consistently judged weak following the Office of Education Standard Inspections. And so the Ministry of Education served them notices of improvement to facilitate their progress and to ensure compliance. By virtue of Section 18 of the Education Act 2016, we also enacted the ministry and the three schools to receive school improvement support for six months. And I'm happy to say, despite naysayers, Mr. Speaker, none of our government schools have received a weak inspection. Dual enrollment program. Mr. Speaker, we have strengthened our support for the dual enrollment program through a memorandum of understanding with UCCI. This partnership has led to renovations, to refurbishments of the dual enrollment classroom at UCCI with plans to further expand and accommodate to meet the growing demand. The Ministry is also currently piloting a TVET dual enrollment pathway program at UCCI. This aims to benefit some 25 promising Caymanian students. Through this program, year 11 students are identified and provided with a comprehensive training module, enabling them to acquire an internationally recognized certification in year 12. This unique initiative, Mr. Speaker, equips students with the necessary skills to secure fulfilling careers. Upon completion, students will earn a level two diploma from UCCI, their high school diploma, and industry certification. The pilot includes courses in computer, computer technician and construction technology child safety, guarding, and positive behavior in our schools. Mr. Speaker, to promote child safety and positive behavior in our schools, which is of utmost importance, the Ministry has implemented various initiatives. The online child safeguarding module has been completed with over 2,700 individuals, while the in-person module has been successfully completed by 1,250 participants and 43 educational institutions. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the Team Tech program introduced in October of last year provided training to approximately 300 teaching staff and school security officers on effective behavior management strategies. Following extensive consultations, the Education Amendment Act was successfully passed by Parliament last year. This pivotal legislation now requires that all schools implement an anti-bullying policy that aligns with our national policy. Mr. Speaker, we have also developed the anti-bullying schools regulations and an update to our national policy. 30% of schools have revised their school policy to align with the new national policy. Remaining schools are expected to do so before the end of this year. Earlier this year, we launched an extensive awareness campaign to promote the provision of the anti-bullying schools regulation pertaining to prevention and reporting and response to bullying. And I wish to thank the Honorable Member from West Bay, Ms. Catherine, for her interest and keen assistance as it related to this specific piece of legislation. Early childhood assistance program, Mr. Speaker. The Ministry has also taken significant steps to support early childhood education. The Early Childhood Assistance Program, otherwise known as ECAP, was extended for summer schools as we found that children were left often unattended while their parents had to work. So we provided for the first time this year financial assistance to enable parents for our early childhood centers. Additionally, the Early Childhood Care and Education Unit launched an ECAP online program to simplify the application process. To address the lack of early childhood learning facilities in Northside and Eastern districts, we introduced this Smart Start Early Simulation Program. This 30-week program aimed to provide young children's readiness for school, support families in creating conducive home environment. Upon its conclusion, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry opened a nursery, another first in the district of East End, 
annexed to the East End Primary School, catering to 20 young learners from East End and Northside catchment areas. This facility provides a safe and nurturing environment with morning and aftercare programs. As you know, it takes forever and a day until we get that East West arterial put in place for those in the Eastern District and Northside to um, get to their work and return home. So we as a government have done what good governments are expected to do, fill the gap by providing early morning and aftercare for Northside and Eastern young children. Mr. Speaker, members of this Honorable House will be pleased to learn that my ministry have provided significant support for early childhood care and education centers through its early childhood care and education unit. This includes, but are not limited to, hosting weekly support sessions with centers that receive weak rating on their Office of Education Standards inspections, collaboration with the wellness centers to train over 100 parents and caregivers as part of the Growing Brain Program, partnering with Kids Ability to provide financial support to five parents and their children to attend more than words and the Hanen program for parents of children with autism or social communication difficulties and providing one-to-one -one support to 85% of the designated leads for special education and disabilities assigned to the ECC centers to facilitate clear understanding of the process with the preparation of their administrative files. Before I conclude with the Minister of Education, Mr. Speaker, I want to mention a few other programs that we have expanded and will continue to do so. This year, the Public School Meals Program has been expanded to include students on alternative placement arrangements and those enrolled in the East End Primary Nursery. This expansion ensures that all of our students have access to nourishment they need to succeed academically. As the members of the Honorable House are fully aware, the meal program ensures that the entire student body enrolled in compulsory government programs receive nutritious meals, not once, but twice on a daily basis. The Swim Free Initiative, another exciting public-private partnership. This year, Mr. Speaker, the ministry supported private community partners including the Flowers Group, DMS, Fosters Group, YMCA Cayman, and the launch of a swim-free initiative for our government primary schools. This program involves a mobile pool. It travels from school to school, offering free water skills training to our children from reception to year two. The training equips our children with life-saving skills which ensures their safety in the water. Since starting at the East End Primary School, it has now been introduced at the Edna Moyle, the Theline McCoy, the Joanna Clark Primary Schools, and it continues to move on throughout Grand Cayman. Finally, Mr. Speaker, we are consistently working to ensure the safety of our students in our care. This term, we introduce an exciting new visitor sign-in platform at the Lighthouse School, the Prospect Primary, the John Gray, and Clifton Hunter High School coming back soon come. The system <clears throat> enhances school safety and security by efficiently managing and monitoring the entry and exit of visitors. Visitors sign in on a digital display kiosk. They receive a visitor's badge with their name, photo and visit details. Visitors are required to wear this, that is their badges at all times while on our campuses. This additional safety measure will be deployed in all of our schools in the coming weeks to ensure the student well-being. And I wish to thank my ICT department who worked assiduously to ensure that we saw um, this program reach the implementation stage. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education is on a trajectory of excellence. <clears throat> For 2024-2025, the projects will be focused on school improvement, leadership development, inclusion, early childhood care, and education. Some of the upcoming projects and priorities in, will be to increase our capacity 
and the public high schools with the hope to reintroduce A-levels into the public school system. Expansion of the TVET curriculum and pathways at UCCI. Enhancing Caymanian culture and heritage in our schools. Establishing an early childhood development hub to increase and strengthen early education programs. Provision of financial assistance to help working families offset the cost for our daycare services. This will include assistance of children from age three to four years to access daycare provision throughout the year. Inclusion of mental health education programs to reduce the stigma and to promote educational and emotional well-being among our children. Mr. Speaker, additional focus will be on those students who are the most vulnerable. We have individualized assistance for these students as well as information and assistance for those in need of support in a timely manner. I would like to thank my team and the Minister of Education, the Department of Education Services for their unvarying commitment and support, their hard work in nurturing these islands and future proofing it. Turning now, <clears throat> turning now to my Ministry of District Administration and Lands. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry is contributing directly to the broad outcomes to improve the quality of life for Caymanians and to provide solutions to improve the well-being of people so they can achieve their full potential. This is being done through the following initiatives. Disability Policy Implementation. The Ministry has embarked on creating space and programs for the learning and development of adults with special needs and disabilities in the sister islands. This centre has been completed and recruitment of staff has now commenced. We anticipate a 2024 opening of this senior adult learnings in the sister islands. Mr. Speaker, we are looking forward with great anticipation to this most needed facility for the 10 or 11 senior adults that have been locked away in their homes because of lack of a facility. The East End Affordable Lots Program. Mr. Speaker, the Minister is moving to the next phase of the East End Subdivision Affordable Land Lots Program. It is anticipated that the distribution of these land lots will occur in 2024. The program will support the distribution of 41 affordable land lots from the East End Subdivision and Progress Government's priority to help Caymanians achieve the dream of home ownership. Improve beach accessibility. Improving beach accessibility is the most vulnerable, is something that is near and dear to us. Mr. Speaker, it will continue to be a priority. The ministry included funding for the mobile mats in 2022-23 budget is seeking to upgrade facilities at many of our public beaches, which will include accessible restrooms, accessible parking, and other features within the scope of support from other stakeholder entities. So Mr. Speaker, our efforts go beyond merely identifying the public beach we enhance them as well in order to ensure that they are maintained and more importantly enjoyed by the people for whom it was bought for, acquired and should be maintained and protected. I am pleased to share how the services of the Lands and the Survey Department have been significantly contributing to the revenue of these Cayman Islands. The effective operation of our Bowman real estate market as well as contributing to the activities to address sustainability. The department has significantly outperformed all metrics amidst increasing service demands. Even though with increasing interest rates and inflation, there was some decline in the real estate activity. As at the 29th day of November this year, the Lands and Survey Department generated stamp duty and rates of fees in excess of 84 million Cayman Island dollars, exceeding our revenue target. Mr. Speaker, the department, which is now celebrating 50 plus years of service to our community, continues to contribute directly to several of the government broad outcomes. 
in order to continue to provide support, efficient service to the growing customer base, the department has implemented a number of new initiatives. One such project is a new online document retrieval portal, which will allow customers the ability to request services, to pay online, receive the relevant service from the land register section. This is expected to be launched early in 2024. Additionally, we are pleased, extremely pleased, Mr. Speaker, to now have a new, spacious, renovated building to house our Sister Islands Land Service Office situated in the Bight on Cayman Brack. We did a soft opening last week and will do the proper opening early in January. At that facility, we're also housing the new office for the affordable housing as we will um, see those houses um, come up like mushrooms is my goal. It's been a long time coming, but good come to those who wait. Other initiatives plan include completing the next phase of the scanning project, creating e-forms for the ease of customers, replacing the program mapping, all key customer service channels to create added efficiencies. A major development of the department, Mr. Speaker, is the purchase of 12 properties, all of which will be for the benefit of the people of the Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, I should also put on notice that it is the deep desire and aspiration of the government that the people of the Cayman Islands would once again be the owners and the beneficiaries of the Barker's property. We do own a significant part of that property, but a significant part is owned by another proprietor in particular. And if it takes me extending my 18-hour days to the 24-hour days, Mr. Truman of the law firm, we will do so. And we will be bringing, at the risk of breaching the rules as it relates to anticipation, Mr. Speaker, we will be bringing a resolution in Finance Committee, um, which will go towards projects such as this beach and environmental conservation properties. But I also believe in the art of negotiation and the team has caucus and we will embark on that art of negotiation. And I believe that unless you aim big, you should not aim at all. We're aiming at Barkers for the people of Cayman. <clears throat> it must be noted that many government entities and statutory authorities use the data as part of their development and planning process to support their operations and monitor charges to our coastline, particularly the beach areas. For the upcoming year, Mr. Speaker, the department has ambitious plans to amend a number of the land and survey related legislation to include the Stamp Duty Act, the Registered Land Act, Land Acquisition, the Tennessee Act, among many others. Shifting to district administration, Mr. Speaker, I am delighted to say we have worked collaboratively over the past few years to address and remedy several concerns, resulting in positive outcomes for the sister islands. We look forward to implementing new programs and initiatives and enhancing current ones to improve the lives of the people of Cayman Brac and Little Cayman. Some of these plans include upgrades and our expansion of the district administration building, which was commenced um, by my colleague, the Honorable Member MP responsible for West End and Little Cayman, the Honorable Moses Kukernel. We will continue to build pairs, public beach facilities, road networks, cemetery space, public parks, and sporting facilities. It is important, Mr. Speaker, for members of the public to recognize that Cayman Brack and Little Cayman do not have the same Cayman Islands government support framework, such as the Needs Assessment Unit. In light of this, provision of assistance for home repairs is not handled by my Honorable DP, but is handled under district administration, and we are desirous for it to so remain. The indigent residents of the Cayman Islands, through district administration and ministry, receive assistance for home repairs through this avenue. The support we provide, Mr. Speaker, has been significant to the indigents who need necessary home repairs. We have been able to assist some 50 projects through the Sister Islands Home Repairs Assistance Program, and I'm happy to report 
that the program has been extended to include the provision of hurricane shutters for the indigent and elderly persons so that we can avoid the mad rush on the impended hurricane or storm for the distribution of plywood. Another program I wish to mention, Mr. Speaker, is the Sister Islands Beach and Community Cleanup Program, one that my colleagues and I wish to extend to Grand Cayman in the upcoming 14 months. It is very near and dear to our hearts. As I created it many, many years ago, it was continued by my colleague for Cayman Rat West and Little Cayman and now continued by this government. Mr. Speaker, the program engages many unemployed Cayman Brack and Little Cayman and a few imports from Grand Cayman who seek in work as well. We take them on board to maintain the beauty and the wonderful nature, pristine nature of our sister islands. Upon taking the reins of district admin, I ensured that necessary funding was put in place to positively engage over 60 Caymanian per year and provide them with a lifeline during this difficult time in their lives. Our plan is to enhance and improve this program over the upcoming years to innovatively and creatively ensure much greater success. Public Land Inspectorate, or the PLC Commission. Inspectorate, they will continue to ensure that beach accesses, very important, are maintained and safeguarded. It will also begin to regulate and permit commercial activity occurring on the designated public lands to ensure its continued safety and proper use. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to report that this year, the Seven Mile Beach Vendor Policy was approved by Cabinet. We also welcome a new chairman and vibrant commission members. I want to take a moment to thank the previous chairman, Mr. Woody DaCosta, for his work was at the Public Lands Commission. Mr. Speaker, in the Ministry's effort to improve customer self-service and innovation, the Shoreline Access Interactive Map, the IMAP, development was initiated. This will provide an online interactive map built on Google Map Framework to provide real-time navigation to all public beaches and public shoreline access, just over 200 registered shore access throughout the Cayman Islands. It is expected that IMAP will be launched as a pilot test program in Q1 of 2024. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we have been working with the PLC to finalize approval of the vendors' applications for the Seven Mile Beach. For the 2024-25 budget, new initiatives include procurement and implementation and case management, review of ticketing process by the PLA, and continued installation of signage across all three islands. Water Authority, Mr. Speaker, the board and authority is celebrating 40 plus years of service here in the Cayman community. And I would like to pause to congratulate them on this wonderful achievement. They have made extraordinary efforts to extend much needed pipe water on Cayman Brack as well, and it's well on its way towards the Eastern District of Spot Bay. The authority is now approaching the creek and has completed through Tibbet Stern and Watering Place. This indeed is a remarkable milestone. I look forward with eager anticipation to the day when the entire Cayman Brack and Little Cayman will have access to pipe water. Finally, on this portfolio, Mr. Speaker, I will briefly speak on the Sister Islands Housing Development. But before doing, permit me also to recognize a former minister, um, to you, Mr. Chair, the Honorable um, Linford Pearson, who contributed significantly towards the Water Authority and Kimmon Brack, and we are eternally grateful, sir. A business case and architectural works was recently completed with a much needed upgrade of the subdivision and house plans. We now await required approvals from the relevant department prior to commencement the final approval application for the affordable homes, and we expect early in 2024 to meet. The board have been newly appointed, and they have been meeting, going through the various applications. Mr. Speaker, the Cabinet Office. Some of the actions that would be processed by the Cabinet Office in the upcoming financial year include coordination and implementation of the older person's policy, 
the national disability policy, as well as the national policy on gender equity and equality. Mr. Speaker, the office will continue to strengthen communication by executing government's communication plan and strategy. Furthermore, I am supportive of enhancing the work of both Radio Cayman and CIG TV as they are most vital for providing genuine, truthful, transparent, accountable, shall I continue, information to our people. We also anticipate that as new legislation and initiatives are being proposed, we will enhance and further utilize the public consultation hub, which has been successfully rolled out. Also, the, the work to represent and protect the interests of the government and the people of the Cayman Islands in the UK will continue to be of significance. We anticipate that when the UK proceeds with the um, Overseas Territories Declaration and a new strategy for the Overseas Territories, there will be a cross-government and national dialogue on bilateral negotiations we would want to discuss with the UK, an exercise that will be heavily focused on public engagement, and to that extent, we've already extended our hand across to the um, opposition, which graciously um, came, met with us, received the presentation from the Cabinet Office, concurred that it was the way to go. We have extended through the correspondence to the UK an invitation for them to come to Cayman to initiate these discussions because all government is local and we believe that that would be a true testament to this new partnership. Mr. Speaker, Hazard Management Cayman Islands HMCI is now part of our Cabinet Office. It is planning the establishment of flood sensors across the Cayman Islands. This project expands on a collaborative effort with a number of stakeholders, including the Ministry of Sustainability and Climate Resiliency, Cayman Islands National Weather Service, Department of Environment, Ministry of Planning, Agriculture, House and Infrastructure, Land Survey Department, National Road Authority, and Water Authority. The HMCI intends to expand this project across all three islands post-pilot phase. HMCI will also be overseeing a risk analysis consultancy for improved understanding of the storm surge, seismic threat, including acquisition of ground speed acceleration data for earthquakes. In partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, HMCI is working and producing a storm surge and wave impact model for the Cayman Islands. Mr. Speaker, data from this project will inform preparedness and mitigation activities, particularly in regards to the positioning and development of our critical infrastructure and emergency shelters. In the upcoming year, MCI will be requesting capital budget for feasibility and technical requirements consultancy for an extension of the National Emergency Notification System. This system currently includes Radio Interrupt, a mobile alert app which provides real-time location-specific alerts designed to keep the Cayman Islands residents and visitors informed and safe. Additional, Mr. Speaker, I have also taken the responsibility for the National Weather Service, which I'm sure would be no surprise to those of you who know me. While their new purpose-built facilities near the Lynnhurst Road should be completed during this two-year budget cycle, I also anticipate improving the performance of the Doppler radar which is of a vital resource in covering the black hole in the western part of the Caribbean. Mr. Speaker, we are grateful that the Atlantic hurricane season ended a mere few days ago, and we have been spared yet once again. While it was one of the busiest on record, most of the storms veered into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There were 20 named storms, with seven hurricanes coming to life, none of them, praise God, affecting hit in the Cayman Islands. <clears throat> this year gave us an even more fulsome reason 
to celebrate Cayman Thanksgiving. Mr. Speaker, no one can predict the weather. We will be able to dodge the bullet again next season, but one thing I can confidently say, that we strive to be as prepared as possible. I take this opportunity then, Mr. Speaker, to thank the hazard management team, led by the capable Ms. Danielle Coleman, for their continued dedication and work. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> I am grateful for the opportunity to serve as minister for so many important entities. I want to thank the leadership teams, the staff, and all of my ministers for their hard work, dedication, and support. Mr. Speaker, members of this Honorable House, thank you for your indulgence as I presented this morning into the afternoon. I would like to quickly address a few issues that I know that remain a concern in the community, the issues relating to safety and traffic. Firstly, safety and security. Mr. Speaker, the Cayman Islands still remain one of the safest jurisdictions to live, to do business in the region. And although we have seen a spike in crime in recent times, particularly with robberies, I want to assure, in fact, reassure our people that this government will continue to make it a priority to ensure that everyone remains safe and secure as possible, bearing in mind that safety and security is everyone's business. Mr. Speaker, we have confidence in the leadership of the new commissioner, Mr. Kirk Walton, and the brave men and women of the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service, RCEPS, as they work to address this pressing issue. Mr. Speaker, RCEPS talked six strategic priorities over the coming budget cycle will be as follows to prevent and take crime seriously as possible make our roads safe deliver justice for the victim of the crime protect the vulnerable and at risk people improve public confidence in the police and continue to modernize our police service among the key initiatives for 2024-25 our senior level professional development training for our officers, police staff at both the commission and non commission ranks, expansion of the digital forensic lab to support data recovery and cyber crime investigations, introductions of body worn cameras for our firearm support unit, as well as an, the acquisition of a fit for purpose, medium sized multi mission patrol and response vessel for use between the sister islands to address the increase in illicit maritime activity and safety concerns, in particular, the Jamaican drug canoe boats. Mr. Speaker, during the recent district community meetings across the islands, led by Commissioner Walton and his senior command team, RCIPS heard the key concerns and they intend to act upon them to prevent and tackle crime the RCEPS plans to continue with the deployment of the task force dedicated to investigating leads and leveraging intelligence to apprehend subjects, patrol high-risk areas, and maintain its presence on our roads. There will be a focus more on community policing to help prevent antisocial behavior, neighborhood and property crime, while at the same time disrupting and investigating serious and organized crime particularly involving firearms and violent gang-related crime. To deliver justice, Mr. Speaker, for the victims of crime, the RCEPs will provide victims support at every stage of the investigative process, work to reduce reoffending, and provide necessary feedback to the victims of crime. Finally, Mr. Speaker, to improve public confidence in the police, RCEPs is strengthening the organizational culture of strong integrity and ethics. They are working to deliver a visible police service, improving through accessibility to the community, particularly through community officers. Traffic. Another issue that we are actively seeking to address, Mr. Speaker, is traffic. It is a challenge that affects all Caymanians and residents alike particularly those who live in the eastern districts. While my colleague, the minister responsible for road, will speak on infrastructure and transport in a more fulsome manner, I want to mention that the National Roads Authority is well underway 
in upgrading the road network to provide better connectivity and efficiency for travel, especially for daily commute, including the highway system, such as the east-west arterial, and our government is committed to the development and completion of these roads and the new upgrades to the Linford Pearson Road as well. The government is cognizant, Mr. Speaker, that the roads are an important part of our infrastructure for the efficient commuter for people and delivery of the goods and services that we sell to the world and domestic as well. As these upgrades take place, they will continue to be sensitive of the environmental impact and also focus on the importance of integrating storm water management systems in the road work design. Highlights of people-centered budget. Mr. Speaker, while I have earlier gone to great detail on the areas of responsibility of myself and my cabinet members, the portfolios, and the parliamentary secretaries, I want to briefly outline some of the highlights of our UPM government. As can be expected, Mr. Speaker, a government that is putting people first, we have focused on operating expenditure on the areas that most impact our people's well-being and success, notably in education, in health and wellness, in housing and in infrastructure, as well as our natural environment. We will also focus on supporting and grow key industries of financial services and tourism, as well as sustainability. Mr. Speaker, some of the areas we have prioritized the allocation of our operating expenditure include enhancing the budget of the portfolio of the civil service, and great gratitude is extended to Ms. Gloria um, Macfield Nixon for her hard work day in and day out to ensure that the public service pensioners who work for 10 years or more receive an increase in their mini minimum pension to 12000 Hundred and fifty dollars. I wish I could give them twelve thousand from nine fifty per month. Offering property and casualty insurance through Cineco in 2024. This is a diversification that we're seeking to implement through Cineco to introduce greater competition in the market with a vision of reducing the high vehicle and property insurance rates. Supporting the opera operational of the first residential long-term mental health facility in 2024, ensuring the Ministry of Education plans to develop and implement a framework for free tertiary education and local universities for Caymanians. Mr. Speaker, as our people navigate the increase in living expenses caused by the pandemic, rising oil prices, global conflicts, and wars in diverse places, we want to give the assurance that the United People's Movement is heavily interested in investing and providing economic and social programs to support them. Mr. Speaker, we will continue the free meals program in all of our public schools to provide parents with the peace of mind that their children are receiving good nutrition, which is a key for enhancing learning. We will implement an affordable residential landlord in Easton and on Cayman Brack through the Ministry of District Administration lands and continue the construction of affordable homes through the National Housing Development Trust and the Sister Islands Affordable Homes. New revenue measures. Mr. Speaker, to fund our intended programs and achieve our goals of helping our people thrive, the government requires revenue to fund our expenditure. To meet our projections and adequately fund the important programs outlined herein, we had to implement new revenue streams. Mr. Speaker, while it is necessary to increase fees, we all understand that these actions are taken in order to address specific financial demands and to achieve broader economic objectives for the benefit of our people. The revenue generated through these new fees plays a vital role in funding critical public services, health care, education, and other essential social programs that contribute to the overall well-being of our society. The decision, Mr. Speaker, to introduce new revenue measures was not taken lightly, and we have made every effort to ensure 
the new or increased fees are non-inflationary and do not impact the already high cost of living for the average Caymanian. The 2024-25 budget includes measures that will yield an additional revenue of 52 million in 2024 and 80 million in 2025. The additional revenue measures primarily relate to new and increased administrative and regulatory fees charged by the General Registry, the Department for International Tax Compliance, the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, and the Department of Commerce and Investment. Increased immigration application fees, custom duties and fees, including increasing environmental tax on hybrid and electrical vehicles, increasing the import duty rate on hybrid and electrical vehicles with a value of more than $70,000, increasing customs and procedural fines, increasing the fees for visa extensions for persons wanting to extend their time here in Caymanian. Obviously, that would not be a Caymanian. Increasing stamp duty rates payable to properties purchased in high-end geographical areas on Grand Cayman. These new revenue measures, Mr. Speaker, will go towards funding our operational expenses. Several capital projects benefiting our people are also planned during this budget period, including CIG land ownership for future projects through the Ministry of Lands, major education infrastructure improvements through the Ministry of Education, including the continuing and completion of the work of the John Gray High School, Project B and C. Phase construction of a multi-purpose hall at the Theoline McCoy Primary School Hall. Phase construction of a new Kim and Brack High School. Lighthouse School expansion. Phase construction of a new high school in West Bay. University College of the Cayman Island expansion projects. To support buildings and infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, for the entities under the remit, remit of health and wellness, includes the relocation and construction of the Department of Environmental Health new facilities on Grand Cayman at a cost of two million, fleet replacement at the Department of Environmental Health at a cost of 1.7 million, fleet mosquito research and control unit aircraft at a cost of 2.5 million. Under the oversight of the Minister of Home Affairs to complete the design and pre-construction work of a new prison at a cost of three million over two years. Several infrastructure and housing projects under the remit of the Minister of Agriculture, Planning, Housing, Transport and Development, major road works, 26.5 million over two years. District upgrades including parks, civic centers, ramps, jetties, and other development and infrastructural funds, 10.1 million over two years. Building and repairing homes under the oversight of the NHDT, 15 million over two years. Consultancy and project management services under proposed C subsea cable, landfill remediation under the oversight of the Minister of Sustainability, climate resiliency and co at the cost of 1.4 million, projects under the Minister of Tourism and Ports, establishment of a tourism attraction facility managed by the National Attraction Authority to include a restaurant, bar, entertainment, as well as job training for 200 Caymanian students and a new location of the craft market, $2 million over two years. Compliance with the framework of fiscal responsibility, um, we will continue, Mr. Speaker, in the 2024-2025 budget. The Minister of Finance will continue on the operating and capital expenditure. The revenue measures will lead an additional $51.9 million in 2024 and $80 million in 2025 borrowings of 150 over 24 and 2025 financial years, the government will be in full compliance with the framework of fiscal financial responsibility and the principles for 2024, 2025 financial years. Mr. Speaker, members of this Honorable House, you can clearly see that the 2024, 2025 budget has been prepared with our people foremost in our mind. It offers an approach that is filled with hope and optimism for the people of the Cayman Islands and demonstrates the United People Movement commitment to responsible management of the public finances. It also is a reflection of our top priorities for the well-being of our people. 
Mr. Speaker, as a former educator, my overriding mission is to ensure that all of our people have access to the opportunities that will allow them to develop their full potential and live their life they envision for themselves and their families. As a cabinet, as a government, we have collectively done our very best to be strategic, prudent, far-sighted in our budget allocations going forward, as that is the only way to ensure that all Caymanians and residents continue to have a good quality of life within our Caymanian shores. The government will strategically work to address our inherent vulnerability with appropriate focus on building resilience. Mr. Speaker, moving forward, there can be absolutely no denying that the overlapping global crisis of the past three years have been the most severe in decades, and their impact has been felt by developed and developing countries alike. In the Cayman Islands, we have weathered the COVID-19 pandemic. We have experienced the worst global health crisis in our lifetime. We struggle with worldwide supply chain challenges. We dealt with the demand caused by Hurricane Grace. We have navigated and continue to navigate through the cost of living challenges. But Mr. Speaker, we remain ever so strong and resilient. We are indeed thankful for the removal of the Financial Action Task Force Gray List, economic expansion, which is expected to continue with a projected growth of 3.1% in 2023 and 2.2% 2 .2 in 2024. Growth in stay over and cruise ship and arrivals with 105% increase in total visitation compared to the same period in 2022. We have seen a reduction in the underemployment rate for the lowest in decades. Mr. Speaker, these successes that we celebrate belong to every Caymanian and residents who have played their part in the island's progress. From the valiant efforts of our healthcare workers, our police officers, firefighters, tourism workers, educators, construction workers, private sector community, members of the civil and wider public service, every Caymanian has contributed to our collective success. So, Mr. Speaker, as I bring my presentation to a close, please forgive me for taking a moment to reflect on the awesome privilege of standing in this House here today to present this budget on behalf of my elected colleagues, a budget of over one billion Cayman Islands dollars. It is certainly worth a pause for us to reflect on the successes here in these beautiful Cayman Islands. Oh, to think just how far we've come in these beautiful, beautiful Isles, Cayman. In Michael Creighton's landmark work, Founded Upon the Seas, it records that 100 years ago, and I quote, the island's budget remained comfortably balanced throughout the 1920s, ranging between 6,000 pounds and 8,000 pounds a year. As a result, official salaries were increased and the plan for compulsory education was finally implemented in 1920. Funds were also found to construct a simple but commodious building as a peace memorial in Georgetown, which served as a courthouse a similar room and town hall, end of court. Of course, Mr. Speaker, that building has been aptly renamed Constitution Hall, given its historical importance by your good self. But let us consider that important piece of infrastructure that was built some 100 years ago. Isn't it interesting to see that the more things change, the more they remain the same? A key priority back then was education. It remains the same today. And imagine, Mr. Speaker, they even found a way back then, in 1920, to uplift the salaries of public servants at that time. It remains the same today. None of us alive today bore witness to the debates that would have potentially transpired some 100 years ago. 
when her budget was between six and eight thousand pounds a year. Yet we have all benefited from the foresight and the stewardship of those decision makers who wisely allocated the budget at that time. And so we take on that baton of responsibility very, very seriously. They made the best of what they had. While it's tempting to think that the sheer scale of this budget gives us greater latitude, it actually gives us greater responsibility. For it has been said, to whom much is given, much is required. Mr. Speaker, I make this appeal today to all of my colleagues in this Honorable House. Let us never forget our solemn oaths and our duties as members of Parliament to serve as trustees for our people. We have been blessed beyond measure to be able to enjoy a level of prosperity our forefathers and mothers could never have imagined. That means we have to be good stewards of these financial resources and ensure that every penny, every project, every effort or initiative, and yes, every piece of legislation is for the benefit and betterment of the people of the Cayman Islands, our Caymanian people. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, it should be beneficial to future generations so that our descendants can reap the rewards of our foresight. In the words of the late Reverend Peter Ribel, we build, and I quote, on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shades we did not plant. We dig, we drink from wells that we did not dig. We profit from persons that we did not know. This is as it should be. Together, we are more than any one person could be. Together, we can build across generations. Together, we can renew our hope and faith in the life that is yet to be unfolded. Together, we can heed the call to a ministry of care and justice. We are ever bound in community. May it always be so, unquote. Mr. Speaker, it should be, in my considered view, our collective prayer that the Cayman Islands will always be bound in community and served by caring governments who put our people first. The 2024-2025 budget sets out this sad vision for the United People's Movement, and indeed it addresses the question as I commence, who are we developing for? And that is, that is our Caymanian people. There are many diverse needs, and yes, there are increasing amount of wants. That will come naturally with a growing and more diverse population. And placing the needs of our people first, we may have to change directions sometimes and our approach. So let us proceed, knowing that even 100 years ago, when our budget was a mere fraction of what is being presented today, we managed those resources well, and we did not depend on aid or intervention from the United Kingdom. <clears throat> I say, Mr. Speaker, that to remind us that our hard-fought constitutional anatomy and strong global reputation is because we have demonstrated the ability to effectively manage our domestic affairs, especially from a fiscal prudent perspective. It is my intention and that of my government to ensure that this continues. Mr. Speaker, as we are moving in the right direction, and I did not mean towards lunch, but I can sense the audacity of hope amongst our people. I too am optimistic, Mr. Speaker. We are aligned with the words of Matthew 7, 24 to 27, which says, a wise man who built his house upon the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house, but it did not fall 
because it had been founded on the rock, and so are we. The Cayman Islands stands on that solid rock today, Mr. Speaker, with the support of every member of this honorable parliament and our Caymanian people and residents alike. We can and we will build on the accomplishments of our past, which contributes to a more resilient economy, as well as the foundation of making our Cayman Islands a great, fantastic place to live for everyone who are honored and privileged to call these three islands home. I pray, Mr. Speaker, God's continued blessings on these beautiful Cayman Islands and seek his guidance as we discuss and debate the budget for 24 and 25. I want to thank the hard-working and dedicated team of the Parliament for all their work that has gone into making these proceedings run as smoothly as it has and will continue to do. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I especially want to thank the people of Cayman Brack East for entrusting me to be the voice of them for some 28 years. To represent them in this honorable house, I consider it a tremendous honor to be a servant leader. May it please you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Premier. There can be no doubt in your stamina. I am minded to take the luncheon suspension, but before I do, I have been asked and I have granted permission to the minister from East End, I can't remember all his titles, to allow the East End Primary School students to regale us with some joyful Christmas carols in the lobby. So I would ask members to proceed there as soon as we can so that we can enjoy the benefit of those young people's voices. So the House will now suspend for lunch until 2.15 p.m. en punto. <laughs>